everyone. I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Happiness Hour. My goal here is to help us all connect, inspire, and create. Every week, a new guest joins us to share a bit of inspiration, creativity, and tips on how you can improve your photography portfolio. Upcoming presentations can be found on my website at lindanickel.com. Under Happiness Hour, you'll find the links to my YouTube channel and our community blog. Elaine Pruden is here tonight to monitor the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. Say hello, Elaine. Hello, everybody. My guest tonight is John Sharp. John is a landscape and travel photographer. His travels have taken him to epic landscapes in the United States and internationally, but his playground in Alabama provides him with just as many challenging and beautiful subjects. In tonight's presentation, John will talk about visualization, planning and travel, composition, lens choice, exposure settings, and his post-processing techniques. John will also discuss the difference between a good shot and an epic shot. Welcome to the Happiness Hour, John. Thank you so much, Linda. I appreciate you having me. I am super, super, super excited, and I know you know the story because I've told it many, many times. And for those of you that don't, uh, full disclosure, I met John about five years ago, October 2016, because I looked it up, John. We, were, right. we weren't sure what year it was because <laughs> um, I remember months and I remember locations and the most random stuff, but I, I cannot keep up with years. And um, I was invited by my friend Brenda Barrett to join this group of photographers that she met at a meetup meet up. and uh, they were being uh, very exclusive. They were keeping it in a limited number. And so she said, please go. And I'm like, you know, all of them, I don't know anybody. And she got special permission. I heard later to, to let me come with her. And so I went and within a few minutes, everybody was super nice, super nice, super good, great, fantastic, generous photographers. And I followed them around for three or four days and I learned things that I, I, I just didn't know. I didn't know how to use a tripod. Uh, John will tell you that he is, I've, he kept thinking my little dinky tripod was going to break and fall over in the water. Um, within minutes of meeting these people, I was following them down ravines, steep ravines. Um, I can always get down to places. I can't always get back up. And I learned so much in those three or four days that my brain just kind of exploded because that was where I realized I was taking pictures, but I wasn't creating images. I was just documenting and not really understanding the, the creativity and the art and the technical stuff. And because of that, John Sharp, Jill Vandegrift, Mark Franks, Marty Anzaldo, Jeannie Newell, Sandy Jorgensen, I'm going to get in trouble, um, Leslie <laughs> Heisey, uh, B. Rosen Rosenleaf, Rosenblue Leaf. I don't know what her last name is. It's escaping me. Um, but she will actually be, I talked her into coming and speaking to us later this summer. Um, these people were absolutely kind and generous with their time. And I credit them for making me try harder and do better. So with that, John, I cannot do another, a, a, a better, more sincere introduction for you. So um, thank you for coming and thank you for sharing what you have been sharing with me for, for years. And so I'm hoping that um people here in the room will walk away with like a little light that goes off for them because of you. And by the way, he's on Instagram because of me. That's what he learned from me that weekend. So with that, it's yours. All right, here we go. So I'm honored, Linda, for you inviting me on this, on this, well, I started to say podcast, but on this YouTube channel, um, what you're doing is phenomenal because you're bringing so many people together and so many people are meeting. And this is how I learned back from the beginning. I'll go on that in a minute. But what you're doing is bringing so many different people together from all different genres of photography and everybody's learning. And that's what I like about your channel so much, because like tonight, I'm going to talk about landscape. But last week you had uh, Jose on there talking about how to shoot uh, 
um, insects and bees. And I mean, that was like incredible. And the work he was doing was phenomenal. And that, and that knowledge is priceless to learn how to do that. And you've created this environment to do that. So I appreciate what you're doing. So, and I'm honored that I feel like I've kind of, I helped you get started. And I appreciate what you're saying there. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. So I'm going to go into my story and just kind of share how I got started and maybe a little bit about me uh, and spend just a few minutes before we start getting into the nitty gritty of it. And but basically my story with photography began back in 2011 and I got into it many reasons, the same other, same reasons that many others do is I had a child, a son that was doing competitive gymnastics and cheerleading. So I wanted to capture moments of him doing that. And, uh, the only way I do, knew how to do that, go buy a camera. So I went down to Sam's, I bought me a Canon T1i and over the next year, I was taking pictures of his advance and I was putting the camera in uh, the little, I call it the running man mode, but that's a sports mode on top of the camera. And I was trying to take decent pictures. Well, I didn't take hardly any decent pictures and everything was blurry and fuzzy and the no good, the lighting was no good. So I had, I had an inkling idea. Let me just buy a better camera. So the next year I upgraded to a Canon 5D Mark II, pretty big jump at the time. That was around 2012. And lo and behold, guess what? My images were still horrible. And I struggled and struggled trying to do that. Well, about the same time as I bought the 5D Mark II, I'd already put that much money into it. I really wanted to learn. And um, my son put me on board of a podcast and understanding what podcast was because I was fussing at him because he was running my phone bill up and I didn't know why he was doing it. Well, that night at work, I went online and found a podcast called improvephotography.com episode number two and i was running on the treadmill at work that night and i was listening to what what jim harmer was doing with uh his podcast and it was just full of beginners just like myself all calling in questions and over the next year i was able to learn so much from that and they started doing meetups all over the place and I joined in on some of the meetups they were doing. So that's where I met a lot of the people that brought me and lended together was through the meetups that we did with Improved Photography. And I'm going to talk more about that as I go into my presentation. But as time progressed, my son, I was still predominantly only doing uh, sports portraits. And, and I was also learning how to do portraits myself using off-camera lighting. And I was learning that through Improved because they were teaching all that. And um, so around 2014-ish, I said, I need to find some other genre because my son was outgrowing what he was doing, getting away from it and going into his other chapter of his life. So I, then I started getting into landscapes. And when I found landscapes, I have never looked back. And that's just kind of been where I've been uh, for the last uh, basically five, six years. And I still do portraits on the side. I'll do senior pictures because I really enjoy doing that. And I do that for clients. And I don't charge a whole lot, but I do charge a little bit for doing that. But my landscape photography is all for me. I just do it because that's, that's my getaway from, from my job and uh, from the stresses of that I got of that. So that's what I enjoy. And I started doing the traveling and I just got addicted to it more or less. So um, basically in the last five years, that's kind of what I've done. So I've done some traveling. I've learned how to travel on a budget. Uh, cause I don't have a lot of money to travel. So I just, I just try to do it as cheaply as I can. And, uh, so I'm going to go into my presentation and kind of first start off. So I'm going to talk a little bit about travel tips for a budget. And we'll talk about how I schedule airfare, car rental, and some of the lodging that I do. And I'm going to talk about some of the apps that I use for research and for scouting. I'm going to talk about my style. And again, this is, this is how I have learned how to make images that I like. Others may not like, and that's fine with me because my landscape images, I do it for myself. And um, finding compositions, I'm gonna talk about how I set up for those. I'm gonna talk about the visions that I see in images and then how I can try to create those. Landscape, um, I'm gonna talk about landscape and travel photos. I got quite a few there. And then I'm gonna end it with going through uh, my favorite place in the world to photograph. Alabama and that's kind of because it's close to it's home for me 
and it's convenient and we've got some amazing amazing places in alabama to photograph so moving on talking about travel tips for a budget one of the first things i do is when i decide on i want to go make pictures somewhere and i want to find cheap flights i'll go to kayak.com backslash explore this is a screenshot of the of their website when it pulls up i will put in that i am going to fly out of nashville and then it will find on a map cheap flights or inexpensive flights all over the world, basically, not just the United States, but all over the world. And the only downside to this app is that the dates are fixed. So you have to be very flexible on the dates that you travel in order to use this. You can really get some great deals. Like you can see, I can fly over to LA for $71. Los Angeles or Las Vegas for $105. I have a friend of mine that used this app and he flew uh, his family to uh, Dublin, Ireland for $461. And again, he was flexible with his dates, but you can get some really good deals on traveling. Another way that I use, and I use this more because my dates unfortunately are not very flexible, uh, is Google Flights. So I'll go on Google Flights, I'll put in where I wanna go and here's a real life scenario. Uh, me and my wife are going to um, Glacier National Park in July. So I have put in the search engine to show me when the flights for the dates that I've got listed will be at a better rate. So I will select and track prices, and then I will receive an email when the prices drop below some certain level. Uh, so then once I see that level, then I'll go on Google Flights. I can book the flight. And then I don't book from a third party. This is what I like about this app is you don't book from the third party app. You go directly to the airline and book everything through that particular airline. And I prefer to do that if I'm available because that way, if I make changes, it's easier, it's easier to deal with a deal with the airline than a third party uh, unit. So there's four ways of getting through an airport fairly quickly and talking mostly about uh, getting through TSA. And one is TSA PreCheck. And that's the one that I've been using for several years uh, because I don't really fly internationally a lot. But uh, the second one is, uh, and the advantage of TSA PreCheck is you don't have to take your shoes off. You don't have to take your belt off. You don't have to take your hat off. You don't have to unpack your camera gear or your laptop. You can go straight through uh, PreCheck and not have to do any of that. So. That is really, really nice. That's $85 for five years. Global Entry does the same thing, but it will do it internationally. And it's $100 for five years. The reason I didn't get it, because when I signed up for it, I had to go to Atlanta to do all the processing. And that was not convenient for me. So I just went ahead and did the, the normal TSA um, pre-check. The third one is clearme.com. I don't use this one because it costs $179 a year. But if you fly a lot, if you fly every couple of weeks, and I have people at work do, that do use that, and it helps uh, to get through the uh, process a little bit quicker. And then the last one that I recommend is if you fly internationally is to use what is called mobile passport. And when you come in through uh, customs, when you land, then you've already answered all the declaration questions they've got, and you can breeze right through the custom line. So that's a free app. So I recommend everyone to get that app and use it if you're flying internationally. Car rentals. So when I book my flight, I'll go directly over to, and I use dollar rental car a lot, but you can use any of them. And I will book my car rental, which is usually about five or six weeks out from my trip. And then when I get about one week out from my trip, this is something I learned on one of the financial podcasts that I listened to, go back online and reshop for car rental. And when you're about a week out, normally because the inventory is still there, you will get a better rate. So, so often I'll save anywhere from 80 to hundred dollars by going on a week after and then booking my car. And then I'll just go in and cancel the other reservation I got. So again, I'm always trying to find a way to save money when traveling. Biggest thing is for travel expenses that you'll find is lodging. I will often stay, uh, if it's available, I'll stay at campgrounds. Um, I do car camping and then I do cabin camping. Uh, car camping is a little, it's very, it's, it's very um, convenient if 
you're alone and but a campground car camping a campground is safe so you always have to look at the safety factor of that and if you don't want to if you don't want to car camp then you got you can rent cabins at campgrounds for example when we go to Glacier National Park in July, <clears throat> I've already rented a cabin in July. This is peak time for Glacier. I rented a cabin um, for $110 a night uh, in Glacier. So all the all the everything else is usually about three to four hundred dollars a night. So I'm saving money on on that. So, but we got a cabin, so it's nice. Uh, the other thing that you that on the West Coast you, you can look for and um, is juicyusa.com. If you want to rent a mobile or a small mini RV, then you can rent that, and then you got the convenience of that. And then again, this is this is strictly if you're if you're looking at photography trips. Uh, if you can camp close to where you're taking pictures at sunset, sunrise, it's it's very convenient that you don't have to drive an hour um, and uh, to your spot the next morning if you're staying in a hotel. So I find that convenient. My wife, I never get her to do any of that. But if I'm alone, I have no issues trying to do that. Some of the research apps that I use, Google Earth, that one I use predominantly for tracking locations. When I'm going to go somewhere, I'll look and see uh, just what the terrain looks like. And uh, I love using Google Earth. I use it at home, too, which I'll show an example here in a moment. Photo pills, I use photo pills for looking at the night sky, knowing the calendar for the moon, knowing where the Milky Way is going to be, if I'm going to be able to have any shot of using or shooting a Milky Way on a trip, I use photo pills. Uh, I use TPE a lot too for sunset sunrise. It's great out for looking at sunset sunrise. I'm not going to go into a lot of details with those because there's so much out there on those. But looking at Google Earth, let's talk about that for a minute. Here's an example of when you, when you pull up Google Earth this is uh, an example of Little River Canyon, where I it's about an hour from where I live. And I was trying to make an, I was wanting to see if I could get an image from inside the river and still have uh, the cliffs in the background. There's not a lot of mountains in Alabama, just a lot of rolling hills mostly. But if I could simulate what a mountain would look like, then if I get, if I got down in the river, where could I see, um, see this see and try to again i'm trying to visualize the image that i'm wanting so i knew there's an area here that's a parking area where you got a trail in little river canyon there's not a lot of access from the rim road down to the canyon because the walls are so steep and i don't do a lot of rock climbing so i'm on i'm on a nice safe trail to walk down i knew this trail was one so I've been down there before and I've never seen the uh, cliffs before, but I've never gotten into the river. I've always just gone on the edges of the tree line and I can't see it. But when I got to looking at Google Earth and started looking at it, I was thinking, okay, if I get in the river, then I possibly can see this cliff that's just right here. And maybe I could have, maybe make a decent image. So lo and behold, uh, a few days after I was looking at that, I went and I made this image. And this is, I had to go about halfway into the river, which it was only about knee deep river. It's not a very deep river. And uh, I was able to find the foreground element uh, with some running water. And I was able to capture this cliff range, which looks like a mountain in my image. And I did that in the fall and uh, I was pleased with the outcome of that. So, and I'm happy to know about that area. Um, but moving on, talking about my style of shooting. The one thing I look for is compositions and landscapes. And I am, when I was going through the learning phase of improved photography, the, uh, the better photographers I learned were looking for foreground interest. You wanted to have a foreground interest to draw the, the, draw the viewer's eye into the image. And then that could be a numerous things. It could be rocks, it could be white water, it could be shapes, it could be leading lines etc. It could be roads, it could be piers, it could be a number of things that just draws the eye into it. And as a beginner, um, I was focused mostly on, oh, that's a pretty sky. Oh, that's the lake is pretty. And I was just taking snapshots of those. But I really wasn't trying to compose the image the way I should. And what I learned, too, was that when my, my biggest tool that I have in my bag, I guess it's actually in my pocket, is my cell phone. 
So I'll go scouting around using my cell phone and look for a foreground interest that looks good on a screen. So that helps me visualize if the image is going to look good or not. And then I'll, I'll move my camera to a vertical location and, or my phone to a vertical location to see and also zoom in and see what happens when I do that. So using a cell phone is a wonderful tool before you even get your camera out of the bag. Next thing, of course, you want to have mid-ground interest and you got to have a background interest. And those are the things that I look for uh, in my images. So as we go through now and we start looking uh, at a lot of images, you will see that the majority of my images will have these three elements in there. And obviously I choose the best time to go in the best light to go that I, that is available to me. So moving on, the first image, this image, this is at my house, and um, I had I've lived in my house for 26 years. I've been working in Huntsville for almost 20 years, and I've been driving by this location. There's a road right here. I've been driving by this location for that long. I have never noticed a crop of boulders on the side of this side of this shoreline that is that was there. And one night I was driving home from work and the sun had lit it up where it was noticeable and it, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And this was just like a couple of months ago. So I pulled over, I walked down there and I'm like, holy cow, I have found Boulder Beach in Gunnersville. And I actually sent my friend Danny, who lives in Gunnersville too, a text and says, hey, look what I found. And uh, we have to go back here and take photos. So a few nights later, Danny and I went back and uh, I was able to capture this image because we had a decent sunset that night. And, but what I did was I found this crop of rocks that shaped like a triangle. And it also looked kind of like an arrow. And when I saw that shape, I'm like, okay, this could be an arrow pointing toward the sunset. And then I had the mid-ground, I had this, the water as in the reflections in the water in the mid ground. And then we of course had the sky lighting up. So it made for an interesting photo to me. And the one thing at first, when I made the image, I had ripples in the water. So one thing I did there is I put on an ND filter and went for a lot longer exposure so I could smooth out the water. So I could get that more dramatic effect for that. Cause I, I, I prefer smoother water, just my personal preference over real choppy water. So moving on from this one spot as a demonstration of what we're looking at as far as foreground, midground, background. The next image, we're going to go to West Virginia. So last October, my wife and I pulled our little camper. We have a little teardrop camper that we travel in. And we pulled it up to West Virginia strictly to go to Babcock State Park. This is called Glade Creek Grist Mill. And we were very, very fortunate uh, on this trip because um, my friend Danny was here a week prior, but he was, his goal was to go further north to when the foliage was peak in a place called Dolly Sides, West Virginia. And, but he stopped by here. And a week earlier, there was no water in the creek and there were no, the leaves had not changed. So me by going a week later, I nailed it because I had everything I wanted. And we were fortunate because the whole time that we were driving up, we were driving up with a hurricane. So a hurricane had just hit the Gulf and it got to North Alabama about the time we were leaving. And the, the hurricane followed us all the way up into West Virginia. And what that did, it put water in the creek. Without that hurricane driving up, uh, we would not have had any water. It would have been a trickle and I would not have been able to make this photo at all. I would have gotten the, I would have gotten the grist mill and the leaves, but the leaves may not have been as vibrant because they had been real dry. So that's what that rain did. But when I saw this, when I was milling around the area looking for a comp, this is what I found. And if you notice, this is what I'm talking about. I've got kind of a, kind of a line of the whitewater is leading up to the grist mill and I've got the background, I've got the leaves that are just in full peak and the mid-ground interest being the mill, obviously, that I thought was, this was probably one of my favorite images I made on that trip. The next image is also in uh, <clears throat> West Virginia. It's still supporting my same style of shooting. Uh, 
waded down to this little area, this little waterfall area. And I had my camera just inches away from this little falling water. Uh, it's very small, but when you get your camera on there with a 1635 and you're at 16, everything in front of your camera lens is expanded as everything in the back starts depressed, uh, getting smaller. So then still supporting my style, I've got uh, the waterfall in the midground and we've got the colors in the background. The next image, of course, is the same place uh, of the grist mill, but this time I wanted something a little different. And I hadn't seen this composition taken before, mostly from this location, you're a lot further back and you're higher up. And I made that photo, but I wanted to do something different too. So on this one, I, I put on my waders and I scurried down a little, a little embankment. It wasn't very much. It wasn't hard to walk on it at all. But I went down and I waded into the water. It was about five deep here. And I set my tripod up, got it very sturdy. Because I knew you guys can probably do multiple exposures on this image. Because when I'm shooting waterfalls, I like to target about a half a second, maybe a third of a second. So I, don't, so I still have texture in the falls. I wasn't worried about my settings for the background. I was just mostly worried about the water. And then when I set up for the waterfall, I noticed that I had that, what I said earlier, choppy water. So I wanted to smooth out the water. So I did multiple exposures on this specific, this specific image where I did an exposure blend. So I shot for the waterfall and then I shot another picture for the, the, the pond or the, the pool where I had the flowing water, where it was flowing directly to me. And then I just blended those together in, in Photoshop uh, using simple layer mask that you can learn how to do that on, on YouTube. I'm not gonna go into that editing style, but that's, that's how I do. I've been a Canon shooter ever since I started and Canon has not been the best for dynamic range. It's better now, I'm, I'm shooting the 5D Mark IV camera now, but it's a lot better than it used to be. But I had to learn uh, with the 5D Mark III that if I wanted to capture all the light of properly without doing an HDR image, I had to learn how to exposure blend. And it took me a while because I was very challenged with learning Photoshop. It was very difficult, but it took me a while to learn how to do that. All right, next image. My wife and I went out to Arizona and Utah a couple of years ago, and I made this image. Now, this lesson on this image is never leave too soon. We were set up, many of you have probably been to Monument Valley, but we were set up at the Overlook um, as along with about 65, 70 other photographers and the clouds were very, very thick. It didn't look like we were gonna have any kind of sunset whatsoever. Well, after sun actually had set is when I made this photograph. So when sun set, everybody was packing up, everybody was pulling out except for me and about three other photographers. We hung around because we were just sitting there talking. My wife was back at the hotel and um, I was only about 10 minutes from the hotel from where I was at. So I said, okay, if I wait another 30 minutes, and that's the lesson I learned way back when was never leave, leave too soon. And we only had one night at Monument Valley. The next night we were going somewhere else. And so we stayed and lo and behold, there was an opening in the sky um, so that allowed light to come in. And when it did, it was just glorious. And I was set up on this shot and I just, it was just like my heart was stopping because I knew I was getting a killer image with the light that we had. And I was so glad I didn't leave because everybody else had pretty much had left. All right, moving on. Let's go to Iceland for a few, for a few screen, for a few shots. This is a image of Brewer Foss and a steel again, it's a vertical, obviously, and I have used the same areas as far as foreground, midground, background. So foreground, I'm looking at the running, the rushing water. And this water is the most turquoise water I have ever seen. This is all glacier melt, and it's just, it's just gorgeous. And we actually went down and made some photos, and we waded in about right here in this area and made photos up close of all this. But the images I'm sharing now in... What I want to talk about is, of course, I'm using a 16 millimeter lens and you don't have to live when you're doing landscapes. Don't live with 16 millimeter lens all the time. Try different stuff because the two lenses that I use most is a 70 to 200 and the 1635. And I'll use them 
pretty much uh, about the same. So when the lighting was gone in the sky, I pulled off my 1635, I zoomed in to 200, and I was able to capture that. So basically, it's a completely different image. It's the same place, but I was very, very pleased with how this one set up. And there again, I set up the same, the same comp, comp, um, compositional structure, foreground, midground, and I got the background in there. But don't be stuck with a 1635. Use different lenses because it changes the way everything is, is it shows in the image. Okay, staying in Iceland, this is a church called Vic Church. And this image, of course, we, we were there in July, and that's the midnight sun. Literally, that's about midnight right now. That sun is setting. And this was the last image that I made in Iceland uh, before we had a pretty tragic event. And after this, and I was on a workshop with Nick Page. I don't know if many of you know who Nick Page was. I met Nick Page with Improved Photography when we went on our first meetup. Nick was on that meetup also. By then, he was already a professional photographer, but he had not gotten started yet with his podcast, with his workshops, all that. He was just doing mostly portraits for his for his work. Um, but we met up, and of course, everyone, if, if you know Nick, he's just, he's one of the best in the world now as a photographer, and I've done quite a few workshops with him. But this was a Nick Page workshop. And after we left here, we went directly to Black Sand Beach. And I don't have any images from Black Sand Beach because we got to the, to the beach, fatigue had set in. And fatigue for me is, is my worst enemy because I'm not creative. I'm not thinking clearly. Uh, I'm just wanting to go along and just, you know, I was going along with the group about that time. And we were walking. I didn't even put my waders on. I was just wearing, wearing regular shoes. And my buddy Danny was with me. And we were being really, really safe um, because the Black Sand Beach is probably the most dangerous place in Iceland. And we found out why. So we had been on the beach now for a couple hours. And my goal on that, that, at that particular shoot on the beach, because the skies was not really doing a whole lot, and I just wasn't feeling it, was my goal was to keep my feet dry. I just wanted, I was, so I was doing the wave dance. You know what the wave dance is. So as the, the waves come in, then you, then you run away from them. And then as they retreat back, then you can walk in closer to the uh, closer to the water. Well, we've been watching how the waves break for now a couple of hours, and there wasn't really anything crazy going on. And I don't even know if tide was going out or coming in because it was pretty it was staying pretty consistent. Well, Danny was a little bit closer to the waves than what I was. I say a little bit, maybe about ten feet closer to the waves. And we were both set up with our cameras on our tripods, and. Um, I looked down and I saw a wave coming and I'm like, oh, we got to run. Well, Danny had seen it also. So I had my backpack on and my camera, obviously, like I said, was on the tripod. So I picked up my tripod and I started to run and I knew I had to run because this was the largest wave we had seen. And as I started to run, of course, the sand was hard to run in. So I fell. And as soon as I fell, water completely went over me and it, it I had enough sense left to me to where I just raised my arm above the water level that had my tripod in it, which had my camera on it. And I grabbed it low on the tripod so I could raise it up so it wouldn't drown. And I had my bag zipped up so all the water went over my, over my body and my bag so fast, I didn't get a lot of water inside my bag. So I saved my equipment. But remember, I said Danny was about 10 feet closer to the waves than I was. The wave hit him at waist level. It completely knocked him down, and it was it was extremely scary because what he had done was he grabbed his tripod, which had a Canon, which had a Nikon D810 on it with one of those big expensive lenses on it, and he used his tripod that he had extended. He used his tripod as a wedge, and he wedged it into the sand to keep him from getting sucked into the ocean. He broke his tripod leg. But it saved his life because had he been sucked in the water, sucked in the ocean, the way the next waves would have would have uh, it could have crushed him, literally. So he lost everything. He lost everything he had. He lost his all his camera gear. Um, I think he said he had about eight or nine thousand dollars that he lost in that one little episode. And we were being careful. I mean, that whole night we were being super careful. And then that rogue wave came in and took us out. So 
Um, just if you're ever out on Black Sand Beach, remember the story because those waves do not play and they can get you at any time. So anyway, that was my story of Iceland. And moving on, last year, my wife and I, well, basically my family, we did two trips. And I already talked about one. We went to um, West Virginia to do Babcock. But in the very beginning stages of the pandemic, we had already had a trip to Alaska scheduled. And we were all wanting to go. And my son went and my granddaughter went. And what was different about this trip was that we booked a 31-foot RV that we traveled around all around Alaska on. And that's where we stayed. Uh, No hotel rooms at all. We just stayed in our RV. And so it wasn't convenient. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a photography trip, Alaska, that was not planned to be a photography trip. Obviously, I did take my camera, but it was more of a vacation. We're going to drive around Alaska. We're going to see what we can see. Uh, my granddaughter enjoyed it. She had a good time, but also my son had a good time, too, uh, being able to see that because I didn't know if he'd ever get to go back with us or not because of his work schedule. So we kept the schedule. Uh, we stayed quarantined to our RV. We never really, we went in some grocery stores, but other than that, um, the local government said that was fine for us to go ahead and plan to come to Alaska and quarantine ourselves to our RV. So that was really about the only people we ever saw was in the grocery stores and at gas station, gas stations, but everything else was, was very, very open. We didn't have any issues at all, but this image, we were driving back from Seaward and I had my camera on ready. So I had a 7200 on the camera body and I had it between uh, the seats in the front cab. And when I saw this image in my side mirror, obviously I don't have a rear view mirror. I'm going to be RV. When I saw this image, I said, I got, I told my wife, I, like, I got to stop. I got to stop right now. <clears throat> she says, you can't stop right now. I says, watch me. I'm going to stop. So I pulled as far off the road as I could possibly get that big old beast I was driving off the road. I jumped out of the car because I already had my camera already because this was the shot I was looking for. I was wanting a road, a straight road with a big mountain at the end of it. And I was going to get this shot. Well, when I got out of the, got out of the RV, uh, I heard some woman start screaming and hollering at me. She was coming down her driveway because I heard a bunch of dogs barking. Well, I, lo and behold, the only place in the world I would stop was by someone's residents where they have a dog mushing uh, kennel so there was hundreds of dogs just I, and I got them all distraught when I stopped and she thought I was in trouble she thought I was having a breakdown when she saw me pull out the camera and start making pictures I think she started swearing at me but I was only out in and out in about 15-20 seconds and I made this image so this was one of my favorite images I made from Alaska and you see there I've got the comp the compositions that I'm looking for. I've got a foreground interest. I got a straight line. I got the trees in the midground, and then I've got the tall mountain with uh, a moody sky in the background. John, before you go off, uh, go on to the next photo, Karen's wondering, can you talk about the lighting situation in this particular photo? Absolutely. So I knew I was going to be hand-holding because I knew I wouldn't have any I knew I wouldn't have any uh, chance of trying to set up a tripod. So I bumped up the ISO really, really high on this image. So I exposed for, I focused on the road about a third of the way in, uh, which gave me my focus point. And I knew then I would have everything pretty much in focus. But then I exposed for the highlights. So when I'm shooting, I'm going to expose because it's very easy when I focus on uh, a darker area, then everything could be blown out uh, because it's trying to expose for that. So once I focused on that, um, I exposed for the highlights in the sky, in the where you can see the where you can see the sun rays trying to get through the clouds. I exposed for that because that was the brightest part. So I put my my uh, metering spot on that, and then I made the image. Then when I get in the light room, I'm able to open up the shadows. I'm able to dodge and burn some of the light, how I saw it. And I'm I'm shooting in raw the whole time. So I've I've got a lot of file data to work with. So that's kind of how the lighting was there. And so I did some dodging and burning in uh, Lightroom. But that's how, that's basically how I shot that image was exposed for the highlights. I brought up the shadows in Lightroom. 
and I wasn't overexposed, so I was able to add contrast and uh, dehaze and get the lighting that I wanted to uh, in Lightroom. And that's kind of about, that's how the lighting is set up in that one. But the key is shooting raw, expose for the highlights so you don't blow out the highlights, and then uh, make sure you don't clip the shadows uh, when you're looking at your histogram. And I'm a firm believer in using a histogram on your camera. So you've got the data that you can work with. It may not look so good on your LCD, but as long as you shoot it properly and you don't overexpose or underexpose where you got the data, then you can work with the image. I hope I answered your question. I think you did. Thanks. Staying in Alaska, we drove up to an area on the Kanawha Peninsula. And this is Kanawha River that's right under the sun. And this is, again, around 11 o'clock sunset, um, and this is in May. We had stopped. We'd been driving all around, and we were tired, so we just pulled off. Basically, we just pulled off on the side of the road on a pull-off, and we spent the night. So, I mean, we're in a camper. That's what you do. So I saw this prairie land driving in, and I said, okay, this can make an interesting foreground area if I can find one of these stumps that had some character to it. So this old decayed stump, obviously I put it in my foreground, but what I want to also point out in this image is notice the top of the stump right here. I purposely set the camera up in the height of the camera so this was not extending into the horizon. I didn't want it, I didn't want it to fool with that in Photoshop or Lightroom. I wanted it shot where I didn't have to. I shoot where I have to do as little as possible in edits. So that's how I set this up. And another lesson in this is, of course, um, always look behind you and see what's happening. And that's the bigger lesson in this, in this image and the next image is when the sun was going down, I had the cool clouds in front of me and I got the sun star. But as soon as I captured what I wanted facing that direction, I turned around, I walked and got on the backside of this stump and Lord have mercy. Look at that sky. I couldn't believe it. And I just turned around, that's the other side of the stump, and I made that image. So I was able to get two really decent images <clears throat> right there uh, that I was pleased with. And then I, then I walked back to my camper. My camper was parked right here. I cloned it out because it looked so ugly after like a trailer, basically, right there. So I cloned it out, and uh, I walked back. And we spent the night right there in that one spot. But anyway, that's the lesson there. I always look behind you uh, when you're taking pictures because you never know what's happening because it can be glorious also. From there, we drove down to Homer, Alaska. And again, I'm in this big old RV, so I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of mobility area. So when we drove in, I told my son, I said, um, you see that outcrop of buildings? They're just simple shops and uh, restaurants. But what they have that interests me is they have a, a beginning point and they have an ending point so that it doesn't continuously flow out of the frame. And that was when I saw that, and then I saw the mountains behind it. I'm like, holy cow, I just need a decent sky. We were here a couple of nights, and the road was not my choice, but it, it, was, it is what it was. Uh, that was the only way I could make the image, and I didn't want to try to get rid of the road. Um, I could probably crop it out, but I, don't want to do, I didn't want to do that. So I went down and... Um, I walked down and I put on a, I think I was using a 100 or 400 on this one. I, I rented a 100 and 400. I will often rent gear because I don't use them that much. And if I, and I rented the 400 because I don't shoot wildlife, but I was in a place where I could possibly shoot wildlife. So I rented the 100 and 400 for this trip specifically. And I didn't want to use a 16 to 35 because what a 1635 would have done, if I got closer to the buildings, it would have made those, those mountains super small. And I didn't want that. So I got, I got way back from the buildings and I zoomed in. And then as I zoomed in, the buildings will compress more. And then it looks like the mountains. It looked like what I was seeing. And that's what I wanted. Again, on the light, um, the sky was on fire. I mean, I had some really cool sky really cool light in the sky and then I did some dodging and burning on the mountains to try to bring out some of the snow in certain areas the way the way the <clears throat> the way the sun was hitting it so that's kind of and I put a little bit of I use a radio filter a lot in Lightroom it's probably my favorite tool is a radio filter 
is because the sun was off to my right behind me and to the right so it was shining down on the buildings as you can see so i put a radio tool on the buildings and i just enhanced the exposure just a little bit doing the same thing with the mountains when i brought those out uh, as the sun was hitting them so that was kind of my one of my images from homer that i, I liked because uh, i had to walk to it i mean i just being in a 31 foot travel trailer or a camper you're real you're real limited to, to mobility that you have so from there let's talk about yosemite national park for a few minutes so how did this image transpire you remember i mentioned um i learned through improved photography and we had a lot of meetups with improved photography well i had probably uh four or five that I went on. Some of those I went on with some of the same people. So I got to be friends with uh, several individuals in there that we, we corresponded with a lot. Well, my friend, Mark Franks, and uh, Linda mentioned him earlier that uh, she met him at, at the Smoky Mountains back in 16, um, lives in San Francisco and or right outside of San Francisco at this time. And he and I just happened to start, we were just chatting one day. We're just catching up with each other. It had been a few months since we talked. We were just chatting one day and I was at work and he had, I think he had just retired. And I asked Mark, I says, how's everything doing? And we was just, you know, just, just gabbing back and forth. And I says, what's Yosemite look like? How far are you from Yosemite? He says, I'm only about four hours from Yosemite. He pulled up on webcam um, <clears throat> where they have live webcams throughout the park pulled it up and there was some snow there and i mentioned that i'd love to be able to come shoot yosemite uh in the winter because you don't see a a lot of images in there in the winter because you're real limited to what you can do there in the winter because all the roads pretty much are closed except for a couple well mark said come on out well lower lo and behold i took him seriously on that and i went over at the time we were chatting i went over to uh one of the flight um alps and i looked to see what flights was and the fly to oakland was only like 250 dollars and i didn't think that was very expensive because he's already said i have somewhere to stay his house he invited me in his house and he had a car so i didn't have to rent a car so when i looked at see what the flight was i called my wife and I asked my wife if she had any issues with me going out there for a week and uh, she was fine with it so my boss walked in and i asked my boss if i could have a week off in two weeks and he was fine with it. So from the time that Mark and I started talking about Yosemite, two weeks there, I was making this image. And that's what photography has done. It has brought uh, to me so many friends that I would not have never had or never met had, had you not gone out and done some of these workshops, these meetups, um, because photographers are just to me, I think they're the nicest people there is. I mean, everybody everybody that I met in the photography industry is just super nice, super helpful. Everybody wants to help everybody else. Um, and this is a, a prime case. I mean, Mark invited me to his house. Uh, I've met him a couple times at other meetups, but he invited basically a stranger to his house to stay with him for a week. And uh, we had a blast. We went from Yosemite. And I think the next picture coming up was one of my favorite pictures from the trip. And this is, this is one shot that everybody gets. You go to tunnel view and I pulled the, I pulled the 1635 off. I put on my 7200. I zoomed in as much as I could. And we had some amazing sunlight as a storm was breaking that night. Um, I don't want to call it a storm. We had a weather event that left some snow, uh, but this, the clouds were breaking at sunrise and on El Capitan, the, light was just spectacular so this is another example of use your zoom lenses you got them use them because you can get some really really uh dramatic image so i just zoomed in on the detail of l cap and i i was able to capture capture this image wish we had more snow though from there mark and i went to the coast and we went to an area called uh cypress tree tunnel this is on, um, oh, I can't remember. Um, Point Reyes. Point I'm Reyes. Sorry? That's Point Reyes. Point Reyes, yeah, that's what it is. Point Reyes. I hadn't thought about that in a while. So we went to Point Reyes, and uh, I had seen an image somewhere that 
my friend Maz Peter Iverson made, and he did a video of this area, and he had done it at sunrise, and he went on the opposite side. A lot of people will stand. That's me standing in the middle of the road down there, and but a lot of people will stand there and they'll shoot back at the house that's there, but. He shot, mass shot, and on the other one on the other side, so the trees would be backlit. So I told Mark, I said, that's the shot I want to get. I want to get where the trees are backlit. So we got there at sunset, way before sunrise. It was still dark, and we were waiting on the sun. It was just me and Mark, and then another person drove up. But we were able to capture images like this. Uh, that was just phenomenal. And then about an hour later, we got completely socked in with clouds, but we had glorious light at sunrise and I was tickled to death about having that shot. The next image um, is the Faroe Islands. This is land that is basically time has forgotten. And I say that tongue in cheek, but literally this is probably one of the most unique places I've ever been in my life is to the Faroe Islands. The way this trip transpired, this was a Nick Page workshop. Nick Page had never been to the Faroe Islands, so I was a little reluctant about signing up with Nick. But what Nick did was he partnered partnered with uh, a guy named Maz Peter Iverson, and that's where I met Maz. <clears throat> Maz lives in Denmark, and the Faroes is a set of islands that's owned by Denmark. So he was he knew the area uh, exceptionally well. So. We had a great guide. We had Nick, you know, helping everybody with their photography. And this is one of the uh, epic, I don't want to say epic. I don't like referring to my images as epic. This is one of the iconic uh, shots of Kelsoy Lighthouse. And this image does not really portray how dangerous this area is. And why I say that is because we're all, you know, it's raining a lot. And we were wearing, you know, we were wearing weather clothes. So we had, uh, everything was Gore-Tex, everything was slippery. Uh, everything was, and I didn't realize this at the time. Uh, I didn't find this out until after I got back. But the clothing that we were wearing was called, like the pants, they called them death pants. Because the slopes are so steep, and these are, the slopes are so slippery because they're wet all the time is that if you fall off so get off the trails and you slide, you don't stop. But if you're wearing blue jeans, you get traction and you stop. So the locals wear blue jeans. We were wearing death pants, death clothes. So fortunately, nobody ever got hurt. But that was a, something to remember the next time I go back to uh, the Faroe Islands is that. And what this image doesn't really show is this is the trail. There's a person right here. So I give you a little scale. But this trail is about probably 18 inches, two feet wide, and you can't get off this trail. It's very, very steep. Matter of fact, out of the group that we were with, there were probably, I want to say, eight or 10 other photographers there with us. <clears throat> I was the only person that was brave enough to walk out to where I was at, and I don't know if it's brave enough or foolish enough, but it was one of the two. But this is very, very, I mean, you slide 20 or 30 feet and then you got 2,000 foot drop to your death um, that's how dangerous this was but I was very very careful I was using walking sticks and I was taking my time watch, walk, walking the footing but I knew I wanted this image and actually my friend Danny was a little leery about doing it so I went back and I helped him across so he could get that image because I didn't want him to go home without this image and uh, Maz and Nick were over there with us but uh, they weren't encouraging anybody to do that if they didn't want to uh, because it is, it's, it's dangerous. It really is. It's dangerous. All right, moving on. Oh my goodness. This is an area in the Faroe Islands called, um, Dragomir. I believe it's the name of this. I, I don't, don't ask me how to spell it because I can't spell anything hardly, but nonetheless, this again was, we walked out here for sunset and this is land that's privately owned and it was a four mile hike to this and this is this is what i love about being a travel photographer is the the experiences and the adventures because you just you can't beat them to me i mean i just love the i love the uh, the outdoor atmosphere i love doing the experiences that we do and if i can get a decent picture fine and dandy i love that but my goal is the experiences is what i enjoy 
So this is private land. So we had to have a photographer guide, not Maz, but we had to have hire another photographer guide uh, that we split amongst all ourselves for taking us out here. And it was a photography guide, not a hiking guide, because the landowner sits on the other side of the bay and he watched with his binoculars or his telescope. And if he sees anybody hiking out on his land that he hasn't given permission to, then he's calling the authorities and then the authorities giving a big fine doing jail time or doing whatever it is. So you have to have a guy to do this. You have to pay him a little bit of money to access the land. That's one way the locals are making some money now off their land. And it wasn't much. I think we paid $40 for land access, but then we paid, I think, $500 for the guy to take us out, but we're splitting all that uh, amongst ourselves. So the cost was not that bad, but back to the, back to the hike, this was a four mile hike and sunset was around 11 o'clock, 11 15. So in order to get back, obviously there's a four mile hike back and it was not getting completely dark, but it was getting fairly dark at night. And we, we were tired. It'd been a long, it was a long day. And we actually, a funny thing about this that we didn't know about and our guides didn't tell us until we, until it was too late is there are some birds that protect their nest when this far out. So anything is close to these nests, the birds will start attacking. So we had birds attacking us and these birds are not small birds. They had a wingspan of about four to five feet. And uh, it was funny as I'll get out because it was just a, a one little area that those birds were protecting, but they get everybody. Uh, they get everybody and they die bomb at your head or uh, and we put our tripods up high. So they were going after our tripods, but that was, that was just a fun experience for this. But because the weather this night was so calm, the seas were really soft. We already had it set up with the land owner to pay him more money to drive his fishing boat out and to pick us up. So he was able to drive out that night and pick us up. And we all got taxi back to the car which we were all happy to pay the little extra money for the, uh, for that taxi ride. We were happy about that, but this is an iconic place. You may not recognize it from this shot, but from this next shot, you'll probably recognize it. That's the same area. It's just on the water. It's just on the water line. And there again, <clears throat> I'm supporting my compositional style that I, that I normally do with a foreground interest and a mid ground interest and a background interest. Maz has been here numerous times. And he said that this was the best lighting condition that he had ever witnessed at this location. So we were really, really pleased that we had the light that we had um, that night. And then when the boat on, when the landowner came out with his boat and picked us up, then we even had he what he did. He took us all around these sea stacks and started driving around these so we could see all different sides of those. So he was going to try to pin us through this hole in the boat, but the waves were too rough to do that, so we we didn't do that. But it was a it was a great experience. This again, I think this is the last picture I'm going to show from the Faroe Islands. This is uh, I can't remember the name of it, but uh, this was a this is another iconic spot uh, in in the Faroes that most everyone has seen because it's real. This is real easy to access. You park your car, you walk 100 feet, and there you, there there you are to this point. So. There again, we were blessed with amazing light that night. May I said that this was also the best light he'd ever seen at this location that night we were there. All right, let's come back to the United States. And Linda was on this trip with me when I made this image. I don't think she actually, I think we made this image a day before she or actually arrived. But my other friend, Marty, that I travel with, he and I went out at, and this is a Bass Harbor Lighthouse at Acadia National Park. We went out at, and this normally is a sunset uh, venue, uh, but for whatever reason, we didn't get there at sunset. We decided to go at sunrise. We were trying to fight the crowds off. So this was the, like the epiglow of the sunrise because the sun was rising behind us. And I was able to capture uh, some <clears throat> wave action in the foreground with the lighthouse in the mid ground with the, with some cool colors in the sky in the background. And here I did some dodging and burning using a radial tool on the rocks. Just trying to put a little different contrast on that. <clears throat> it was basically how some of my editing style was, but this was not an exposure blend. I believe all this was done in just one image. 
this was also in Acadia National Park. <clears throat> and I don't remember, Linda, if you walked up to this one the next day or a couple days later. But Marty and I got there, and the day we got there, it rained. We were there early. We got there before anybody else did. And this was our first stop the next day after it rained because I'd seen this image and I wanted to mimic. I'm real bad about co – I'm a copycat, basically. I, I'll tell you that. If I see something I like, I want to try to make it myself. Um, but this is a waterfall tunnel – or waterfall bridge. I'm sorry, waterfall bridge in Acadia. Um, so we hiked up to this waterfall bridge. It's about uh, about 30-minute hike, nothing too bad. And we had enough rain – to where we had a waterfall and a lot of the locals say they rarely have any water flowing in that waterfall in the fall time uh because it's so dry up there normally but i i was able to get and what made this image for me was having the water flowing over this rock in the foreground we went back the next day and the water level had dropped dramatically there was no water flowing over this rock and i was disappointed because so i was trying to help one of the other persons with us uh, I think it was Sandy was really wanting this image bad uh, after she had seen I posted it in the day or next day afterwards, the water was really starting to dry up. Uh, so, John, let me ask you a quick question. Um, I actually was on that trail two days after you guys, and I did get water, but not water like this. That's right. And this, a lot of people know the story, Linda Nickel cannot read a map and should not be left alone on a trail. So I was lost for like two and a half hours and had no idea where I was. So uh, that's where I, I almost like just stayed there. Okay, so Barbara wants to know, do you use focus stacking to get four mid and background sharp? Sometimes. sometimes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sometimes, if my if if my foreground interest or my foreground item is really really close to the lens, I'm talking about eight foot eight inches to a foot, or sometimes even further than that, I will definitely use fo focus stacking. Uh, and normally, when I focus stack the landscape, I normally will only do about two images, three sometimes, but normally two images is what I focus stack. And I'll do that in Photoshop. And um, I don't do it as often as I used to because now I've just, I do if I need to, and I know what I need to. And, um, but I'm lazy when it comes to editing. So I just, I just, when I get it on my computer, I say it's sharp enough. And I don't, I, I may have the images to, to photo, focus stack, but I may not see the need to do that because it may, be, may not be something I'm ever going to print. It's just something that's going to get hit social media, so I don't fool with focus stacking. But I do sometimes. It just depends on the image that I'm trying to make and how close my lens is to the foreground subject. Because if you're, if you're a foot away or if you're um, 16 inches, 18 inches away from the lens, then uh, you focus on the foreground or focus on that point, and then I will focus on the background, and then I'll blend those two images together in Photoshop. Fairly easy. Thank you. Thank you. So, all right, moving on. We're getting close to Alabama, I think. Oh, look what I found. When you're out, take when you're out with groups, take pictures. Oh my God! Why would you do this to me? What did oh, I do to you? No, no, no. This is awesome. This was when Linda and I first met in sixteen at the in the Smoky Mountains. And she was with that rickety tripod. She couldn't take her hand off of it. And she was trying to hold her camera still. And But she was learning. This is what's great. You got people taking pictures. And I, so lesson here is take pictures of people. Because remember, I was a portrait photographer before I was a landscape photographer. So I still have that in me. So I like taking pictures of people. The top right-hand picture, I got my friend Danny, Nick Page, and Majid. Uh, that was in our Iceland workshop, and I thought that was a cool image because they were trying to shoot some birds flying, and they were all targeted on the birds. And then the bottom right-hand picture is um, some people that – well, that was, a, that was sunrise on um, um, the Foothill Mountains in the Smokies, and we were on the Blue Ridge Parkway. And obviously, you can see that's a pretty popular area for, uh, for photographers, and that was our group that was there. And, you know, we were some of the first people on that ridge, and then people just started coming and coming. It was crazy. 
Oh yeah, it was. Like I, it. I bet we had a hundred people there. And I said, I said, I got to get a picture of the people taking pictures because that's to me that was intriguing in itself. All right, so now let's talk about Alabama, and I've been talking a lot. So all right, this is fifteen minutes from my house. Everything from here on out is going to be in Alabama, and. I'm going to move to these fairly quickly because I know I've been talking a long time. This is a waterfall called uh, Short Creek Falls. Alabama is just laced with waterfalls and canyons. A lot of the canyons are small, but this was a this was a, a, a glorious place in just 15 minutes from my house. I can't go here anymore because uh, the landowners don't want anybody out there, so they blocked off any parking and they posted it, but I made this picture before they did all that. Okay. Real quick on this image, this is the Soto State Falls or the Soto Falls at the Soto State Park right outside of Fort Payne, Alabama. This is about an hour, about exactly one hour from my house. And Danny and I went up one morning before sunrise. We hiked in. It's only about a 15, 20 minute hike. And Linda, when you come to Alabama, you're going to go here. And there's enough room on this, this overlook for about two people. And that's about it. Um, because you get too far to the left, too far to the right, then you, you're blocking or we're blocking by the foliage for the falls and we can't see it. So I got this picture at sunrise, but the problem I had with this picture, and it, it's close to what I wanted. I, I, I like the image, but there wasn't that much water in the falls. I, I've seen it with a lot better, a lot more water flowing. So about a month later, my wife and I were going up there to uh, stay in a cabin for a few days. And I came back with one of my favorite images that I made all of last year. And that's this image right here. You can see we got about twice as much water flowing. I hit it at sunrise. I went to a vertical comp so I could capture some of the foreground. Here I am talking about foreground again. I got the trees using that as foreground and trying to frame it up a little bit in the falls. And then I uh, captured the sun, the sunrise behind it. And I've sold a lot of these images. Um, another thing I do is I print a lot of pictures. I, I do all, most all my own printing and uh, I enjoy selling pictures. So, uh, but this is real talk on, on selling prints. I cannot sell a print of the Faroe Islands to anybody because nobody has any emotional ties to the Faroe Islands. But this being local to me, is so close so many people have emotional ties they grew up there their parents took them there as kids they saw it they'll buy these pictures all day long because they got emotional ties to these pictures but i was pleased with this image this is in bankhead national forest if you remember a presentation done by keith bozeman uh probably about two months ago he spends a lot of time in the bankhead national forest doing images and um he is he's a phenomenal photographer if you haven't seen his presentation go back and see his presentation because he he is just so inspiring to me for all the work that he's done in bankhead and i didn't even know about bankhead till i started following keith and that's when i started going the the one the problem i have with this image i didn't realize this when i was taking it is my foreground subject was this rock well i didn't realize that i'd cut this rock off because i didn't see it on my lcd so much and that that's been driving me crazy about that rock being cut off but i just didn't see it because that rock is predominantly underwater so I, I just didn't see it but i that was the only issue i had with that image but other than that i like that picture this is the same waterfall in bankhead and i just composed a, a different area of it with rocks in the foreground and had some really cool mist that was the sun was shining through giving us some light rays and um I did a little work to it in Lightroom, and then I came home with that. This image uh, was probably also one of my favorite images that I made last year. And the quick story behind this image is I'd been at my mother's house all day pretty much mowing and cleaning up her yard. And I knew I was going to come back by Gunnersville State Park and around sunset. So I threw my camera in the car just thinking I was, I was, I was by myself. Nobody was with me. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm thinking differently when I, when I'm alone versus having a non-photographer with me. If someone had been with me, I wouldn't ever stop. But this is a, this is a very photogenic area of Gunnersville where I live. And I knew I've been here a hundred times and I was just hoping for good light. And as I got about 30 minutes away from it and 
I knew the clouds were looking great. I was just ecstatic that I knew I, I was going to be able to make this image. I put on an ND filter. I smoothed out the water. And Lord knows that uh, he was looking out for me because there was an opening in the clouds just for the sun to shine through to give me that sun star. And I love, I love trying to capture sun stars. But anyway, that's at Gunnersville State Park where I live. This image is unique because I've lived in this, I've lived in the same house for 25 years in Gunnersville, something like that. And I thought I knew all the areas for landscape uh, as far as waterfalls close to me. Well, a friend of mine posted this image, or not this image, but he posted this waterfall um, on social media about two months ago now. And I never heard of it. And when he posted the name of it and I Google searched it, it's 15 minutes from my house. And I never knew anything about it. <clears throat> so my son and I, we hiked up there and um, just to scout it out. And then the next day I went up at sunrise and I made the image because it was just so close to my house. But what I didn't realize, I knew there was a, probably a cave underneath this because there was no stream coming out. The water just kind of disappears into the ground. So Alabama is covered with an amazing cavern system. We've got, I've got some friends who are, who are cavers and he told me there's like 6,000 caves just in North Alabama. I don't go in the caves uh, very much. Uh, it, it just doesn't do anything for me. Um, but um, this cave, he, when, when I posted it, he said that waterfall has a secret. And I said, what's the secret? He said, there's a 390 foot drop right below the base of that water into an amazing cave. Of course, I don't have a picture of it, but <clears throat> I went on Google and looked at it, and um, it, it's an amazing cavern system underneath that. But you have to repel in it, repel down in that, and it's not for me. Now, having said that, there is a cave in Alabama that you can access. And Linda, when you come, you're going to go to this cave. Keith showed it in his slide presentation a couple months ago, but here it is. This is called Stevens Gap Cave, and I was with Keith and my friend Danny when we made this picture. But again, it got the foreground, got the midground, and got the background. Got waterfalls everywhere, and we went right after a heavy rain, and uh, so there was water raging everywhere. But this is a this is a uh, fun place to be for a photographer. This is also about when I showed you that uh, pier picture a while ago in the lake. This is about 15 minutes away from that. Uh, this is also what I've got at my house in Alabama to photograph. This is called uh, Buck's Pocket State Park. And it's just a, <clears throat> it's a gorgeous little canyon where you've got some outcrops of rocks. And it's, it's just a, it's a nice place to photograph. All right, we're getting almost to the end. This is when, when you're running out of things to photograph and in the fall, I go out to the park and I've got just a curvy, a curvy um, walking path through one of our local parks. And I made this picture. And uh, it's been, uh, it's been a, it was a success. Whereas a lot of times the, the local government in Gunnersville, uh, they know me and they know my work and they'll call me and they'll want to buy rights to images that are local stuff. And so I've sold a bunch of pictures and a bunch of rights to the local government for uh, whatever, whatever, basically for whatever they want to use it for. I give them the rights to do that, except for selling. They just can't print and sell images. I'm okay with everything else. This is Little River Canyon again. The very first image that I showed you, this is the beginning of the falls. And this was one I made in, at fall uh, a couple of years ago from an overlook area. And it's just, a, it's just Alabama has got some gorgeous, gorgeous spots in it to photograph. This is also about 30 minutes from my house. And in the fall, uh, this, this is a park. And this cover bridge is just a walking cover bridge for people to walk in. It's not for driving. It's just for wa a walking path. And I framed it up to where I had all these foliage framing it, framing the image and uh, got the reflections and I, I like that image. But there again, <clears throat> that's what we have to put up with in Alabama in the fall. I live on a lake, as you've seen, and one of my favorite things is to shoot in the fog. We have this uh, sailboat marina 
just a few minutes from my house. Actually, it's about five minutes from my house. So if I can see the conditions are right, I can shoot right up there to it and make some photographs. And I made this photograph one morning. On the other side of town, we have another marina. And it's the, my favorite boathouse that I've ever photographed. And I photographed it about a million times. And I've taken a lot of other photographers to this boathouse. But this boathouse is one of my favorite things to shoot at sunrise because you got the sun coming up in the background. And it's got one little neon light that they burn in the, uh, on the porch of that boathouse. And it gives you just enough illuminance to light everything up to give it that kind of little extra 10% for an image. And I just love that that little light is on that boathouse. Oh, mercy. So there we go. Thank you very much for Linda for inviting me to come do this. I've had a blast showing off some of my pictures because that's what, as a photographer, that's what we want to do. We want to make pictures and we want people to look at them. I mean, if we, we didn't want people to look at them, we wouldn't be doing it. So that's kind of where we're at. I'm in the process of uh, working with Heather on getting a website. I don't have a website now. Uh, but hopefully within the next month, I'll have one up and rolling so I can display some of my other pictures on it. But right now, I'm just on uh, Instagram. I do a little bit on Facebook, but mostly I like the Instagram platform better than Facebook. So I am going to stop sharing, Linda, and take a drink and then see if you got any questions. So between you and Keith Bozeman, who is in the room, by the way, um, Alabama's tourism uh, budget should just be exploding uh, <laughs> because you guys have done such a beautiful job at representing your state. And, you know, Alabama's one of the states that I've driven through that I've never stopped because I didn't know anybody there. And I, I didn't know there, that there was so many pretty things off that highway. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to come visit. So it's, oh, it's, yeah, it's a done deal. Are. It's just a matter of us figuring out when I can do that. So a couple of questions. Uh, Mika wants to know, what printer do you use? I use a Canon Pro 100. Okay. I'm fixing the upgrade to the Canon Pro 300. It's a newer model. I've been using my printer for about six, possibly seven years now, and I've never had any issues with it, but I do a lot of printing. and I, It's when, back in my portrait days, and I didn't talk about this, but uh, all the portraits that I shoot for people, I print all my pictures. So it's had a lot, a lot of use, especially when I, when I had my photography business, when I was doing a lot of sports and a lot of kids, I would do that to save money. So I wouldn't have to, I wouldn't have to hire out printing done. So I did it myself, but the printing, the Canon Pro 100 is still available and it's still out there. And it's a very inexpensive printer but it's a phenomenal printer and the ink for it is very inexpensive, but you get a, a full set of ink on Amazon for about $110. And I think it's got, it's got eight ink cartridges. So I highly recommend it. Okay. So this isn't so much a question. It's one of the things that I put in your description that you were going to tell me the difference between a good shot and an epic shot. And let's start with the word epic. I very rarely use that word because I just don't like it because I I don't know. I think I don't. Maybe it's because it's overused. Maybe because I don't. I haven't achieved what epic is. What? How would you define it? Do you think you've? Do you think that you've accomplished that in your work? I uh, personally, I think I do, uh, because of the three elements that I look for. I look for a foreground interest, and my focus is I want to get the foreground interest where it's composed properly, to where it's lined up to to bring in the mid ground and then to show off the background. I mean, look at those pictures I took of uh, the gristmill at Babcock State Park. I had all those, I had everything working. I had the exposures properly done where I'm not overexposing anything. I'm showing the textures in those images. And, but for me, that's what I'm looking for. Now, as far as uh, the difference between a good image and an epic image is like, if you go out, for me example, if I go out to the lake, and I take a, a pretty picture of I've got the lake in the in the image, nothing really going on in the lake, just a lake. And then I've got a nice sky. That's a good image. But when you put like I did a rock formations or I put a pier, something that you can tie into the image, every every element of the image, then 
that's when you start getting into an epic image, in my opinion. Okay. Um, there is a question going back to printing. Ben wants to know, if you print your own images, how do you then mount them for framing? Oh, well, that's another thing I got. I am a woodworker. So that's another hobby that I have. So I build all my own frames. And I will take, and my buddy Danny, he has a, um, he, he, he runs, he's CEO and president of a company. It's a mat board company. So he will make the mat boards for me. So I'll math the pictures. I'll let him get the picture. He'll math the pictures for me and then bring them back to me. And then um, I'll finish off the frames and stuff. And then I'll go to a frame shop and have a glass cut for those. But if you don't, if you don't a woodworker, because you have to get the technical aspects of building the frames because the joints are, are difficult to, to make sure they don't break, is you can go to a frame shop. So you can also go and take your images to a frame shop like Hobby Lobby. You can catch deals at Hobby Lobby. A lot of, a lot of towns will have a, a frame shop that's just a dedicated frame shop. And you can get some really good deals own frames there and they'll do all the matting and everything for you. So there's a lot of outlets out there for framing. Um, so not so much a question, more of a request. Um, <laughs> this is self-serving. Thank you, Mika. Uh, Mika is hoping to see maybe an editing presentation, you editing presentation from you in the near future. So just let that simmer and think about it. And I won't bug you for a little bit, but okay. I will circle back and see if that's something I can persuade you to do. We'll see. I, I personally, just me personally, um, <clears throat> watching editing, it gets kind of monotonous because after about 10 minutes, you know, click this brush, click this brush, click this brush. But I know um, I could give, a, I could give some, I could give a lot of tutorials that are out there on YouTube of some really good people that I, especially in Photoshop that I use for editing, but uh, I'm not against that. Maybe, maybe in the future we could do that. I'll have to think about that. Yeah. Just okay. let it simmer. Just let, yeah, it simmer. I'll let it I'll let it simmer. You know, you, yeah. So uh, I'm not going to be demanding, but you've got about <laughs> six months to think about it. Okay. Um, so John mentioned that he's got a website that's going to go up in a couple of maybe, in, maybe in a month or so. Um, do you have the name for your website? It yet? will most likely be John Sharp Photography. Okay. So the person that's doing his website is Heather Foster, who was here, gosh, help me out, maybe a month ago? No, actually oh, about two weeks ago. About two weeks ago, three weeks ago. See, I'm terrible. I, I have no, I have no uh, re frame of reference for time. Um, so she's... She did a presentation for us on social media for photographers. So John has, has connected with her and you can find her at starstreetcreative.com. So um, real quick, John, uh, Gary's wondering who would you recommend for your, for your YouTube videos for, I'm sorry, for uh, editing. <laughs> for editing. And as far as uh, landscape editing, Mark yeah. Dini. He does an excellent, excellent job as far as, I think I got his name right, as far as editing. Is it Mark Denny? It's Mark Denny. I was talking yeah. about Mark Denny just earlier, yeah. earlier before we started. I like, I like, he'll go on and he'll do some editing on there. Um, Nick Page does editing yeah. on YouTube, so you can follow Nick Page. Nick Page, is he's a master at editing. There's no doubt as far as landscape. And then portraits is a whole different ballgame. We're not going to get into portraits, but uh, that's where I get into more of the Photoshop stuff, but okay, great. We'll take those too. Um, so I think there were a lot of nice comments for you, and I Thank will you. definitely get you the chat uh, texts or whatever. I don't know what you call it, the chat line. But with that, I'm going to shut you down. Is there anything you want to say last minute before I? No, just thank you again, Linda. I, I had a blast putting this together because you hit me up about six months ago, and I think I think I just finished it about forty-five minutes before we started. Then I had technical difficulties and got that straightened out. But uh, anyway, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I, I so appreciate you, and um, I know that some of our 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 buddies from that smoky trip. Um, are in the room because they wanted to to be here and support you. And um, I just 
my heart melts when I think of all of you guys, because you guys really, really made an impression on me. And um, I am forever grateful. So guys, with that, let me close them out. Um, you can connect with John on Instagram at John Sharp Photography. And next week, Judy Royal Glenn will be here to talk about hummingbirds. She'll tell us how to find them, how to photograph them in their natural habitat. So until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again soon. Mm -hmm.